as you've heard, uh, my name is uh, Jack Graham. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Isaac Allman. Uh, I'm going to discuss cybersecurity laws and best practices for human resource professionals pre-breach, and uh, Mr. Allman will discuss the same post-breach with a discussion of how to handle public relations. So cybersecurity in 2018. Uh, Data privacy and data security are top concerns for major tech companies around the world in 2018. Uh, cybersecurity and various breach systems have dominated the news cycle for the past several years, uh, with uh, the Equifax breach and the Uber cover-out being uh, two big breaches that have been in the news recently. However, it's important to note that most of the time, cyber attacks are not performed on billion-dollar multinational corporations. The vast majority of the time, breaches and attacks happen to relatively small businesses that the majority of hackers view as easier to gain access to. In 2015, cyber attacks were estimated to cost businesses worldwide roughly $400 billion per year, and roughly 71% of those attacks were focused on small businesses. So I think it's important to, uh, when protecting yourself and your business, to understand the methods that most cyber criminals use when attempting to gain access to your system. Uh, sometimes these words get said to individuals with no technical education or experience, so it's important to have at least a basic understanding of what each word means. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of these, but a, uh, a particularly big one these days is ransomware. Uh, ransomware, as the description says, uh, is a program that holds a computer system hostage while demanding a ransom for access to that system. If you don't pay, the hackers can either make your, your data public or delete it forever. Once you pay, the ransomware gives you control of your system again if the hackers are feeling generous. It's just as likely that the cyber criminal will continue to extort you for more money after getting the initial payment. After getting what they need, many of these hackers will delete the system and disappear. So some employees are more likely to be attacked than others. This is likely uh, to do with uh, what information they have access to or what abilities they have at the office. For these employees, it's often valuable to get some extra training or emphasize cybersecurity more than others. Uh, first are executives. These are more likely to be attacked simply because they have access to information, financial records, and financial accounts. Uh, they also generally have unique abilities and clearances to perform sensitive functions that most employees do not have access to. Uh, second are administrative assistants. These employees uh, naturally have the same type of information as executives. Um, it's important to uh, educate them and emphasize the dangers of mysterious emails and rogue internet programs. Uh, third are salespeople. Salespeople have access to confidential consumer information and are particularly susceptible to FTC violations. Um, and lastly are you, the human resource employee. Uh, these employees have access to confidential employee information and are particularly susceptible to HIPAA violations. So we're going to cover some statutes on cybersecurity. First, a quick note on state laws regarding cybersecurity. Uh, 48 states, as well as the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands all have enacted laws requiring notification of security breaches involving personal information. Most states have laws that are significantly different, with California easily being the most robust. Alabama and South Dakota are the only two states with no security breach law at all. So we're going to go over some federal laws regarding cybersecurity and data protection. Um, the first thing to note is that these are not all the federal laws on this topic. These are just some of the ones that are most often enforced by governmental agencies. So first up is the, uh, the FTC Act. The FTC Act applies to most companies and individuals doing business in the U.S., other than uh, certain transportation, telecommunication, and financial companies. Uh, the primary reason uh, for their absence is that these industries are already heavily regulated by other national agencies. Uh, the FTC is not concerned with uh, specific categories of data. Uh, instead, they uh, prohibit unfair, deceptive acts or practices that fail to safeguard or misrepresent the security provided, uh, the security provided for personal information. Uh, they uh, Unfair or deceptive acts or practices are prohibited, and the FTC has previously charged companies which failed to protect consumer personal data, changed privacy policies without providing notice, or have simply failed to comply with their posted privacy policy. So uh, what is personal information or data under the FTC? Um, as you can see, most information uh, 
one uh, thing in particular to keep in mind is that last one, uh, the one that states uh, that any information combined with an identifier described above. Um, so that means that any information that is not considered personal information can become personal information if it has been combined with other personal information. Up next is uh, HIPAA. Uh, HIPAA is largely split between two rules, uh, the privacy rule and the security rule. Uh, the privacy rule establishes a national standard for the protection of privacy of individually identifiable health information, uh, which is called uh, protective health information or PHI. Uh, the security rule established a national set of standards for protecting that health information that is held or transmitted in electronic form. This is designed to protect the privacy of PHI while allowing covered entities to adopt new technologies to improve the quality of patient care. Uh, the rule is designed to be flexible and scalable so that a company can implement policies that are appropriate for its size and complexity. The security rule does not apply to PHI transmitted only in orally or in writing. So many businesses think that they are exempt from HIPAA compliance because they are not within the healthcare industry. However, the Department of Health and Human Services requires any business associate that stores, processes, transmits, or touches PHI in any way to comply with HIPAA requirements. Business associates are under an obligation to protect PHI under HIPAA requirements. What is a business associate? A business associate is a person or entity that performs certain functions that involve the use or disclosure of PHI. Business associates can be legal, consulting, data aggregation, management, administrative, processing, or financial organizations. A covered entity, on the other hand, is a health plan, healthcare clearinghouse, or healthcare provider that electronically transmits health information. The Department of Health and Human Services requires you to sign a business associate agreement with the covered entities that you assist. Business associate agreements must conform with the uh, elements specified in that statute. In general, the primary responsibility for PHI protection is for the covered entity, but the Department of Health and Human Services makes it clear that a business associate must offer satisfactory assurance that PHI will be appropriately safeguarded. Some covered entities will request a completed risk analysis, request the implementation of a standard risk management plan, or perform a HIPAA audit before they send patient data. In addition, some covered entities choose to personally audit each of the business associates that they do business with. So basic tips for HIPAA compliance for business associates. Uh, first, uh, there are some technical safeguards. Uh, the first and most important safeguard is to read your business associate agreement. Review it carefully to ensure that you are currently compliant with all written requirements. Second, you need to implement a means of access control. A mechanism should be introduced to authenticate whether or not PHI has been altered or destroyed in an unauthorized manner. Devices should also have the functionality to encrypt messages when they are sent beyond the internal firewall server and must be able to decrypt those messages when they are received. Implemented activity audit controls are required. These register attempted access to EPHI and record what has been done with the EPHI once it has been accessed. Lastly, any device that contains EPHI should automatically log its user off of the device they are using after a predefined period of time. This security measure prevents unauthorized access of EPHI should the device be left unattended. Next are the physical safeguards. First, a procedure should be in place to record any person who has physical access to the location where PHI is stored. This includes anyone and everyone from software engineers to handymen. Policies should also be devised and implemented to restrict the use of workstations that have access to PHI. These policies should also specify the protective surrounding of such a workstation so that not just anyone can look on screen and gain access to confidential information. If authorized users at your company wish to use mobile devices to access PHI, then policies must be devised and implemented to govern how PHI is removed from the device before it is reused. 
Lastly, an inventory of all hardware must be maintained along with a record of the movements of each item. A retrievable exact copy of EPHI on those devices must be made before any equipment is moved. Lastly are the administrative safeguards for HIPAA. First, identifying each area in which PHI is being used and determining all the ways breaches of that PHI could reasonably occur. Be creative when thinking about this. This risk assessment should be performed regularly as devices and programs are updated and employees experience turnover. Next, using that information, a risk management policy should be created. Policies should be introduced in response to the risk assessment that are designed to reduce a risk to an appropriate level. It is appropriate to introduce, sanctions, uh, to introduce a sanctions policy for employees who fail to comply with HIPAA regulations. Employees should be trained on how to identify malicious software attacks and malware. This training should be documented. A contingency plan should also be formed to be used in emergencies. Obviously, third-party PHI should be extremely limited. Policies should be in place to ensure that PHI is not accessed by unauthorized organizations or subcontractors. Lastly, there should be a method by which employees can report security incidents. So how can an HR professional assist his or her company in complying with HIPAA? First, consult with your legal department or outside counsel to answer questions about HIPAA's complex requirements. Be curious and ask questions if you have any concerns at all. Next, develop a clear company-wide policy to help your company achieve compliance of your business associate agreements. Just as important, enforce this policy. A policy is only as good as its enforcement. Once a compliance framework has been put in place, educational seminars for staff are encouraged. Systems should be kept up to date, HIPAA approved, and problem free. Internal policies should contain some provisions to keep you organized and orderly. Finally, ask your legal team to perform an audit or have a third party audit you. Look carefully for weaknesses or potential violations in your policy. It's better to discuss these problems and have them corrected than to have the OCR discover them in an audit. All right, so moving on to the uh, Graham Leach Bliley. The Gramm-Leach-Bliley covers financial institutions and requires them to provide notice to consumers that explain their privacy policies and practices. In actuality, the term, is very, the term financial institutions is very broad and is defined as all businesses, regardless of size, that, significant, that are significantly engaged in providing financial products or services. The Gramm-Leach-Bliley primarily has two rules, the privacy rule and the safeguards rule. The privacy rule requires financial institutions to provide notices to consumers that explain their privacy policies. The safeguard rule mandates that financial institutions protect the security, confidentiality, and, integ and integrity of customer information by implementing and maintaining a comprehensive written information program. The security plan that a financial institution arrives at must be appropriate to the company's size and complexity the nature and scope of its activities, and the sensitivity of the customer information it handles. It is not good enough to copy and paste uh, from a security plan. Uh, a company should take a hard look at itself, assess how customer information could be at risk, and then implement safeguards to address those risks. To form a security plan, a financial ins uh, institution must designate employees to coordinate its information security program, identify the risk to customer information in each relevant area of the company's operations, and evaluate the effectiveness of the current safeguards for controlling that risk. They should design and implement a safeguard program and regularly monitor and test it. Select service providers that can maintain appropriate safeguards, uh, that can maintain appropriate safeguards, and make sure your contract requires them to maintain those. Evaluate and adjust the program in light of the circumstances, including changes to the business or results of security testing. Lastly, design and implement policies and procedures to respond to incidents involving unauthorized access. So tips for HR employees under the Graham Leach Bliley. First, determine whether or not you are a financial institution under the GLB. Contact an attorney if you have any questions on that. 
Next, help ensure that your privacy notices are being delivered to your consumers. You must deliver your privacy notice in a way that your customers are reasonably expected to receive it. Lastly, review your internal policies on security. Review your physical security. Look at your employee password requirements. Is all, uh, is all information that is electronically transmitted encrypted? How is your employee training? Are employees up to date on the privacy requirements? Are these procedures in place to prevent terminated employees from accessing customer information? Next, I'll be moving on to uh, HR practices and policies to provide protection for your workplace. The first thing to discuss here are policies on information collection and storage. Starting with security. Security should be a substantial factor in the decision making in every department of a business. Think carefully about the implication of all data decisions and don't settle for simply collecting and maintaining data in the same way that you always have. Be cognizant and be forward thinking about how you collect that information, how long you keep the information, and who is allowed access to that information. So the first big question is, is the information needed? It's a simple fact, but cyber criminals cannot steal what you don't have. You need all the information you collect. If you don't, why are you collecting it? An example of this can be seen in a Rock You Inc. case, in which a company running a website collected information from users, some of which were children under the age of 13. The company collected addresses, passwords, birth date, sex, zip code, and country of a large group of children who were under the age of 13. Defendants then did not protect that information appropriately under the requirements of the FTC. The tough thing to understand here is that Rocky did not need that information in order to run their website. They would not have been subject to these protection requirements had they not requested that information. However, since they did and they didn't follow them, they were subject to an FTC and COPPA enforcement action. The next question is to, or the, the next thing is to not hold on to unneeded information. For information that you have, uh, that you already have, ask yourself, do we need that? Is the information needed for legal reasons? Is the information needed for legitimate business reasons? If the answer to both of these is no, then the information should be appropriately discarded. You should ask yourself this question a lot, but be sure to set up specific times for your company to look inward. Another obvious one is don't use personal information when it is unnecessary. The times in which your business needs to use the sensitive data of your employees or customers should be kept to the minimum. Many companies who don't think about this particular question have been fined for using employee or customer information unnecessarily in training exercises. Next is controlling access to private information. Before an employee has access to private information or data, ask if that employee needs that access as part of their job. Look to the case of Gold Financial, in which a small group of employees transferred more than 7,000 consumer files containing sensitive information to third parties without authorization of the company. The company was found liable for giving unnecessary access because the employees did not need that to perform the functions of their job. This could have been prevented by implementing proper controls and ensuring that only authorized employees with a business need had access to that information. Next are bring your own device policies. Personal devices are now an essential part of the workplace and employees use them to keep in touch with the workplace while they are away from the office. Many companies do not bring formal, many companies do not properly formalize mobile device procedures until it is too late. So there are some concerns and obstacles for bringing your own device, or for bringing your own device policies. Both employees and employers have valid concerns about bringing your own device policies. First, employees are largely concerned with a loss of privacy and don't like the idea of employers having access to their private information. Employers, on the other hand, are concerned with security. Many employees do not appropriately use, monitor, or protect their personal devices. Employees are also concerned about FL employers are also concerned about FLSA overtime laws because a non-exempt employee can work past the clock. Lastly, there are concerns about the requirements of employers to pay for costs incurred in connection with the use of these personal devices. In some states, an employer is required to provide that reimbursement. 
So let's look at the key features of a bring your own device policy. First, use mobile device management technology to create a virtual partition in each device that separates work data from personal data. This will facilitate security measures that the employer wishes to impose. Determine which devices will be permitted and supported and which types of company data, uh, which types of company data people will be able to access from each device. Determine what class of employees will be permitted to use their own devices. Think about why those employees get, to get access to this privilege. Ask employees to agree with acceptable use terms when they first connect with the employer's computer network. Is a non-FLSA exempt employee eligible to bring their own device? If so, develop specific guidelines for when they may work off the clock. You can also consider using MDM technology to limit the ability of a non-exempt employee to use their devices for business purposes outside of normal work hours. Your policy uh, should state the employer's right to access, monitor, delete, and delete information from an employee on device. If the company is allowed to access personal information, state the circumstances under which it might do so. Keep a registry of all personal devices. If the company has technology that will be used to monitor employees, let the employees know. Specify when that monitoring will be used. Explain how the company will protect the employee's information. Provide reasonable notice to employees as to what will cause a wipe of their employer data from their personal devices. Think on what will cause a full wipe and provide proper warning to employees that a full wipe is possible under these circumstances. Put data protection practices in place, including requiring strong passwords and automatic locking. Lastly, what security policy should be in place for personal devices? Users should obviously be required to password protect their devices. They should also have their device set up to factory reset after a number of incorrect attempts to access the phone. Users should not use apps like Gmail or Facebook to share or transfer private information. There should be a stringent reporting procedure for any lost or stolen equipment. Next are policies on technology. First is keeping your software up to date. Computers that are not frequently updated will not have the most recent security patches and are more likely to be hacked. Often software updates roll out after a vulnerability is discovered, so it's critical to update these as quickly as possible. Pay particular attention to third-party software because they are not generally as effective as Microsoft in alerting users that they need to be updated. Backing up data. On this slide is a list of the types of documents that are recommended by the SBA to be backed up regularly. Backups should be stored in a separate location in case of fire or flood so that your business's data does not also disappear if your physical location is destroyed. Backups should be checked regularly to ensure that they are being performed as they should. This one is somewhat obvious, but it's important to have because mistakes will happen. It is essential to have anti-malware installed on all devices on your network and to be sure to properly research what software is right for your business. As with all things, beware of free software. Now we've discussed uh, password policies for personal devices, but password practices for workstation devices can be a little different. Simple or obvious passwords are an extreme security risk to your business. So these have shown that over 63% of all data breaches occur due to lost, stolen, or weak passwords. Passwords should contain uppercase and lowercase letters, at least two numbers, at least one symbol, and should be changed every 60 to 90 days. There's also, there's also multi-factor identification, which is simple to do and adds another layer of protection. Employees' cell phone numbers can be used as a PIN in addition to their passwords, or some systems now have the capability to send a message to other devices, such as a cell phone or a desk phone, and will ask the users for that code. Only by having both the password and a randomly generated PIN will access be granted. These are great because they, made, they make gaining remote access extremely difficult for cyber criminals. Computer and internet usage policies are a vital part of your cybersecurity suite. They're good at laying out expectations of efficiency and security from the employer to the employee. Once upon a time, these were seen as overbearing, but now most companies have computer slash internet usage policies that make these expectations clear. The 
key features of a usage policy. First, it should contain a blanket statement making it clear that any and all company-owned equipment can be monitored at any time with or without notice. It is important to make clear to employees that they have no expectation of privacy on employer equipment. Next, lay out clearly what constitutes improper use of employer-owned equipment. Define and limit employee authorization to access the computer. This policy should also terminate the employee's authorization to access the computer if he or she violates that policy. Your policy should also prohibit the unauthorized encryption of information. This is because employer access to employee password protected accounts is a gray area of the law. If the employee encrypts business information behind his own password protection, it may be much more difficult legally for an employer to gain access. Provide specific disciplinary action that may be taken if the policy is violated. You should also add a zero tolerance policy for communication that is offensive, discriminatory, or constitutes harassment. As always with such restrictions, be careful that any employee Section 7 rights under the NLRA are not being infringed by that, by that zero tolerance policy. Finally, provide copies to the employees in writing and have the employee sign a copy and keep that copy of the signed policy in the employee's file. Be sure to contact your company's attorney to ensure that all bases are covered for your business, employees, and state laws. As with any policy, consistent enforcement is crucial. One concern with usage policies like this are, is employee privacy. Generally, when a workplace computer is owned by the employer, the employee has no reasonable expectation of privacy. However, there are limits such as contracted for rights or state laws. California in particular has a constitutional privacy protection that can be concerning for employers looking to enact such usage policies. Courts often look to employers' policies to determine whether or not the employee had a right to privacy in gray areas. As a result, it is important to have a complete usage policy that has been reviewed and cleared by an attorney. Finally, we have administrative policies, and we'll start with an education of employees. Teach, teach employees on your security standards and make it clear what you expect, that you expect them to comply. Make it clear to all employees that security is an all-hands-on-deck concern. Give basic education to your employees on the common way cyber criminals infiltrate systems. Teach employees to recognize signs of a breach and how to report those signs. Teach employees how to recognize suspicious emails and how to report those around the office to alert others. Be sure to monitor your employees to ensure compliance. An often overlooked aspect of cybersecurity is physical security. The world's most advanced firewalls, anti-malware software, and employee education are wasted if the physical security of your servers is compromised. Create separate user accounts with passwords for each employee's device. Ask questions about anyone who requests access to your computers. Finally, check with the parent company for any unscheduled maintenance or updates. Often, cyber criminals will appear under the guise of being with a technology company that provides services and then use physical access to upload their malware or to steal data. This slide is just a reminder that the most crucial element of any security policy we've gone over is enforcement. A policy that is unenforced is no better than no security policy at all. Lastly, I have a few brief words about cybersecurity insurance. Cybersecurity insurance is a type of standalone coverage that assists companies in recovering from security breach, data loss, service interruption, and so on. Cybersecurity policies can vary wildly between different insurers. One reason for this variability is that risks are difficult to accurately assess given the lack of data. However, cybersecurity is helpful in covering the following losses. Damaged or stolen digital assets, funds uh, stolen electronically by fraud or otherwise, business opportunities which were lost during the interruption, increased operational costs as a result of the interruption, and cyber extortion for things like ransomware. Finally, my tips for cybersecurity. The threats of cybersecurity are so varied uh, that the cost of protecting against all of them can be prohibitively expensive. One solution to this problem is to strongly secure your biggest value target so that a breach or loss is extremely unlikely, then ensure the rest. 
You should also investigate what risks are covered by existing insurance packages to see if your current insurance is already covering some of these risks. You should also know and be prepared for the fact that cybersecurity insurance is not typically adequate to cover intellectual property theft, reputational damage, or business downturn after a security breach. Finally, attempt to engage in discussions with your insurance company about getting lower premiums for your stringent cybersecurity policies. Hello everyone, I'm Isaac Allman. Um, what I'll be talking about today is what you do after a breach. Um, public re relations is your organization's way of communicating with the external wor uh, world. Um, there are a few things you may want to ask when you're planning your PR response to a data breach. One is how do we communicate with our clients or customers? Um, it may be through phone calls, it may be through formal letters, it may be through um, social media or websites, um, you know, different ways businesses communicate with their uh, clients and customers in different ways. Um, the other thing is, is what points do your, does your organization want to make about its integrity, morality, and community focus once a breach um, occurs? And what does the law require? Um, the organization must control the message. Um, ways to do this is one of the most important, I guess, is to have a single point of contact. You don't want 10 different people out speaking on behalf of the organization um, getting 10 different messages. Um, develop talking points. Um, your talking points may be something like um, a data breach occurred and we are doing X, Y, Z to fix it. Um, then you want to bridge over to here are the great things that our organization does and does well. These are the things that are known uh, that we're known for, and this is why our employees and customers love uh, our organization. Um, expect backlash, especially on social media. It's what happens. It's what all the cool kids are doing. It's easy. It's you know kind of low risk for the people doing it, but it's it does tend to um, throw gas on the fire for um, organizations, especially when something bad happens. Um, develop the breach plan. Breach plan. Um, develop your plan and test it. Uh, make sure that the plan articulates the methods for responding to the various types of breach um, that may come up. Um, it should identify the key me members of the response team, describe their particular roles and responsibilities. Um, and it should also um, establish some lines of communication, both internally and externally. Um, these lines of communication may be to forensic vendors or outside counsel. Um, you may, you know, if you're a small organization, you may have an outside vendor that uh, provides your IT uh, uh, analytics and you may rely a lot on them um, when you're trying to figure out what's happened and, and where the wheels sort of run off the wagon. So um, Now like Jack, I'm going to hit the high points. Um, I'm going to focus on HIPAA and Graham Leach uh, because these are the, the sort of the big ones. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that if your, your organization doesn't fall, fall under HIPAA or Graham Leach that you are excused, but these are just the big ones. And as you notice, uh, as I go through these slides, that HIPAA and Graham Leach and, a lot, and even some of the state laws really mirror one another. Um, now, the other thing is, is I've packed a lot on these slides. I've used the reg site, um, and they, the actual reg may or may not ask answer a specific question you have. So, but they are there if you if you need them. Um, covered entities and business associates must provide required notifications in the breach uh, involved in secured protected health information. Jack covered a little bit uh, earlier of what that is and what a business associate is. Um, unsecured means healthy information that has not been rendered unusable, unreadable, or indecipherable to unauthorized persons. Um, after a breach of unsecured health information, covered entities must notify effective individuals in writing without unreasonable delay, but no later than 60 days. 
after discovery of the breach. Um, it, the notice, the individual notice can be by first class mail or by email if the individual has agreed to receive notices like that electronically. Um, if the covered entity has insufficient or out of date contact information for 10 or more individuals, the covered entity must provide substitute individual notice by either posting the notice on the home page of its website for at least 90 days or providing the notice in a major print or broadcast media where the individual likely resides. Now, the, um, this print or broadcast uh, notice must include a toll-free number uh, that remains active for at least 90 days where the individuals can learn if their um, information was involved in the breach. Um, if the covered entity has insufficient or out-of-date contact information for less than 10 individuals, the substitute notice may be by alternative written notice, telephone, or other means. Um, these individuals, individual notices must contain a brief description of the breach, a description of the types of information that were involved in the breach, the steps affected individuals should take to protect themselves from potential harm, a uh, brief description of what the covered entity is doing to investigate the breach, mitigate the harm and prevent future breaches, and the cover in, covered entity's uh, contact information. Um, a covered in entity that has a breach of more than 500 residents in any state or jurisdiction is required in addition to the personal notices to provide notices in a prominent media outlet serving the state or jurisdiction and shall notify the secretary contemporaneously uh, with the individual notice. Um, a breach of less than 500 residents, the covered entity shall maintain a log of such breaches and not less than 60 days after the end of the calendar year uh, provide notice to the secretary. Uh, this media notice must be without re unreasonable delay, uh, but no later than 60 days after discovery of the breach. And it's required to, to have the same information as the written notices. Um, business associates of covered entities um, must notify the covered entity of a breach without unreasonable delay, but no later than 60 days. Um, the business associate should provide the covered entity with the identification of each individual affected by the breach and any other information the uh, covered entity is required to include in its notification. Um, Jack talked a little bit earlier about um, what a business associate is. But going back, when we were talking about earlier the, um, you know, our outside vendors or whatever, this is why you're going to probably need outside IT people if you're a smaller organization is trying to figure out um, who's been breached and, you know, so that you can give specific notice to those folks. Um, breach does not include unintentional acquisition, access, or use of protected health information by a workforce member or person acting under authority of a covered entity or business associate. There's a good faith uh, standard here, um, so it has to, it has to, unintentional acquisition has to have been in good faith. Um, a disclosure of protected health information or a covered entity or business associate has a good faith belief that an unauthorized person to whom the disclosure was made would not reasonably have been able to retain such information. Um, the covered entities and, and business associates have the burden of demonstrating that all required notifications have been provided. This means that you should maintain documentation that all the required notifications were made. This could be, in a, be a copy of a letter that you sent, and a, you know, if you send it certified mail. It doesn't have to be certified mail, but if you send it certified mail, you want to keep a copy of that little green card. If you run a notice in the paper, you want to get the editor of the paper to um, uh, send you an affidavit that says we ran this following notice on such and such dates and such and such issues of our of our paper, which is pretty common for them to do if you're running legal notices. Um, law enforcement delay. If a law enforcement official states that notification could impede a criminal investigation or cause damage to national security, a covered entity um, if the statement is in writing and specifies a time for which a delay is required, delay notification notice or posting uh, for the specified time. If the statement is orally, document the statement, including the identity of the official making the statement, and delay the notification notice or posting temporarily and no longer than 30 days from the oral statement. If a statement like that is made, it's probably best to try to get whoever made it to put it in writing. If not, you can you know, try to fall under 
the um, oral exception. And this would be a time to reach out to counsel and say, what should we do? Um, Now, Graham Leach, a lot of, in a lot of ways, mirrors HIPAA. Um, it's, it does not apply to HIPAA-covered ent entities or to any other entity to the extent that it engages in activities as a business associate of a HIPAA-covered entity. Um, if you have any specific questions on whether you're covered or not, you should probably consult counsel. Um, there's a specific this definition here cited is pretty specific, but there may be some uh, organizations that it's a little bit unclear on whether they're covered or not. Um, each vendor of personal health records following a discovery of a breach of security or unsecured PHR um, identifiable health information uh, must notify each individual and notify the FTC. A third party service provider shall notice a um, breach to official designated in a contract or if not designated to a senior official at a vendor of personal health records related entity. Um, notice shall include identification of each customer of the ven uh, vendor whose PHR identifiable health information has been or reasonably believed to have been acquired during a breach. A breach is discovered as of the first day on which such breach is known or reasonably should have been known to the vendor or personal health records related entity or third party service provider. Um, here again, the notices will look a lot like the HIPAA notices uh, that should, shall be sent uh, without unreasonable delay, but no case later than 90 days after this, the discovery of breach. Um, vendor and third-party service providers have the bur burden of demonstrating that all notifications were made as required. Um, there is a, a, a law, enfor for, uh, law enforcement delay. Um, requirements are similar to HIPAA. They're in that um, section 318.4 if you have any questions. Uh, methods of notice applicable to uh, applicable time periods track HIPAA notices closely. So you can look at that uh, that section of the reg and uh, gives you definite times. Um, complying with Graham Leach, notice has to contain a brief description of what happened, including the date of the breach and the date of the discovery of the breach, if known. Um, a description of the types of unsecured PHR identifiable health information that were involved in the breach. Um, this are things like the name, social security numbers, date of birth, home, home address, account numbers, or disability code. Um, steps that individuals should take to protect themselves from potential harm resulting from breach. A brief description of what the entity um, that suffered the breach is doing to, to investigate the breach, to mitigate harm, and to protect against any further breaches and contact procedures for individuals to ask questions or learn additional information, which um, shall include a toll-free telephone number, an email address, website, or postal address. Violations of the Grand Leach um, are treated as an unfair or deceptive act or practice. Um, financial institutions um, have an affirmative duty to protect their customers' informa information against unauthorized access or use. Um, timely notification of a breach is part of that duty. Um, effective notification may reduce uh, financial institutions' legal risk, as, uh, assist in maintaining good customer relations, and enable customers to protect themselves. Um, when a financial institution becomes aware of an incident of unauthorized access to sensitive customer information, um, the institution can, should conduct a reasonable investigation to promptly determine the likelihood that that information has been or, or will be uh, misused. Um, if the institution de determines that it will be misused, um, then it should notify the effective uh, affected customer as soon as possible. Um, here again, the customer uh, notice can be delayed based on um, law enforcement uh, determination that the notification will interfere with a criminal investigation. Individual notification, here again, it looks, uh, looks a lot like what we've already went over. Um, has to, if 
here is a little bit different. If a financial institution determines, if it can determine each person that is affected, it can just it can just notify that particular person. If it can't narrow it down to the you know the each individual, then it has to notify the whole group within you know if it can narrow it down to a group of individuals, then it has to know. But it can't narrow it to the specific individuals, then it has to notify that entire group. Um, here again, the notice should be in clear and conspicuous manner. Uh, describe the incident in general terms and the type of customer information that was the subject of unauthorized access or use. Notice should describe what the institution has done to protect the customer's information from further unauthorized access. It should include a telephone number that the customers can call for further information or assistance. And it should remind the customers to remain diligent for the next 12 to 24 months to um, and promptly report incidents of suspected identity theft to the institution. Um, when it's appropriate, the notice should include a recommendation that the customer re uh, review account statements and immediately uh, report any sus suspicious activity to the institution. A description of fraud alerts and an explanation of how the customer may place a fraud alert in the customer's consumer reports to put the customer's creditors on notice that the customer may have been a victim of uh, fraud. A recommendation that the customer periodically obtain credit reports from each uh, nationwide credit reporting agency and have information relating to fraudulent transactions deleted. An explanation of how the customer may obtain a credit report free of charge and information about the availability of the um, FTC's online guidance regarding steps a consumer can take uh, to protect against identity theft. Now here, I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of notable uh, data breaches and some of the settlements that have come out of them, um, because I think it's important that you understand that it's a serious thing and it can cost whether you're a multinational organization or sort of a mom and pops uh, organization, most businesses are probably going to collect information that needs to be protected. And it can become, you know, fairly significant um, if it's breached as far as a um, uh, legal liability. Now, the first one here is an Anthem um, case where they settled for $115 million. Um, that one's still pending a judge's approval. Um, in that settlement, Anthem offered two, two years of credit monitor, monitoring or alternative cash compensation to the uh, big victims. Uh, the next one is Target. Uh, it was about a $28.5 million uh, settlement. Part of that settlement goes to 47 states, so they actually a big part of that settlement goes to the states, and the states are supposed to fund programs that help victims of fraud. Um, it must also, Target must also employ an, exec, an executive to manage a comprehensive information security program. It must hire an independent third party to do a comprehensive security assessment. And it must also add measures that um, encrypt payment uh, card information and separate that information from the rest of its network. Um, also remember in the Target case, the longtime CEO um, had to resign and the breach actually hurt pro uh, Target sales and profits. Um, Home Depot paid $134.5 million in compensation to Visa, MasterCard, and various other banks. Um, $19.5 million went to um, consumers and um, Home Depot agreed to provide credit monitoring services for those who were impacted by that. Um, they estimated that the cost of that that whole sale, settlement was about $179 million, but some some folks thought it would be more than that. Um, Sony, $15 million settlement, that was on a PlayStation Network breach. Um, their employees were actually breached also in a different case, and they settled on that one for about $8 million. Um, Ashley Madison um, breach cost them about $11.6 million to consumers and about $1.2 million to states and the FTC.
Stanford University uh, Hospital and Clinics. This is kind of an interesting one. This will show you, too, the exposure that not only the big companies have, but also the little places, too. Um, their settlement was about $4.1 million. Um, there was medical data from Stanford for about uh, 20,000 emergency room patients breached because um, a billing contractor actually um, the billing contractor's marketing agent came in possession of a spreadsheet. That marketing agent actually sent the spreadsheet to a job prospect as part of a skills test. And then the job prospect sent it to an online tutoring website. So um, just a little bit more on that. Um, I think there are a couple of good points that come out of this one, actually, is that the marketing agent was just a one-man shop. The billing, the billing contractor, I think, had about five people who worked for it. The marketing agent had held himself out to be an actual employee of the um, billing contractor. The billing contractor kind of knew this, but never said anything. The marketing agent had an email that that had contained the, the name of the billing contractor in it, like most of us do, like mine's Isaac Allman at Wilson Worley. Um, the, the marketing agent had an email that, that would lead most individuals to think he worked directly for the billing contractor. The point there is, is to make sure that if you all are dealing with agents or you know independent contractors, that those relationships are known to whoever you're working with and that they know what authority they have to make decisions. Um, but anyway, the Stanford sent the spreadsheet to the marketing agent for a project that they actually wanted the billing contractor to do. and then it got lost in the shovel and ended up costing Stanford a lot of money. Um, AvMed, this suit arose out of um, two laptops that had unencrypted stolen, uh, unencrypted information on them. They were actually stolen out of the AvMed's conference room. Um, this case is kind of novel because of the way they argued for damages. Um, the plaintiffs in this case argued that part of their premiums were meant to go to paying for the actual expenses of keeping their private information secure. Um, now, what we'll discuss that actual issue a little bit later, but that is pretty novel, and I don't know if it'll pick up later or not, but if it does, it, it can... Uh, expand damages quite a bit. Um, state law requirements, many of you may not be um, actual, actually covered under federal law, but you may very well be covered under state law. I use Tennessee and Virginia as examples just because that's where we're at and we're familiar with those. Um, the state laws seem to tend to be a little bit more broad than the federal laws that we've talked about today. Um, for example, um, Tennessee um, includes any information holder, which means um, any business that owns, licenses, or maintains computerized data that includes personal information. Virginia law includes a medical information uh, breach notification and a personal information breach notification. So it's kind of still splits that splits it in two. Um, state law notifications, they usually sort of track, or they seem to track the federal law. Um, but don't assume that they track them exactly. And also, this may be a position, a place for you. If something does happen, you have a breach, you may be able to comply with state and federal law at the same time. You may be able to bundle all the notifications into one. Um, but you need to you need to to work with your counsel on that if if something like that were to come up. Um, damages associated with state law breaches vary. Um, for example, Tennessee has civil law penalties that are enforced by the Attorney General. Um, 
a violation of the notification requirements can also be a violation of the Consumer Protection Act here in Tennessee, which has its own set of uh, damage provisions. Uh, Virginia's Attorney General also enforces civil penalties uh, for the notification violations. Um, if the entity is regulated by um, a state regulator, then that regulator is actually the one that enforces the civil penalties. Now here is the measure, the measure of damages, which is pretty important. HIPAA doesn't uh, provide for individual causes of action for violations, so each individual can't sue under HIPAA. Um, the ability of an individual to sue and recover damages is going to depend on state law. Um, and usually, just broadly speaking, damages are based on um, on the demonst demonstrable measure. So um, proving damages can be hard. They have to prove that they've actually been damaged and how much that damage is in dollar figures. And this is where AVMED comes in and is pretty important. The plaintiffs in AVMED argued that the portion of their premiums were going to expenses associated with protecting their identities. Now, the reason it's important is because they argued that they overpaid. That because they paid these premiums and AVMED wasn't actually protecting the, their identity, then that they should get that money back. Now, no one knows really if the courts are going to pick that up um, or not yet. Well, I guess time will tell. The other thing that happened in AVMED was that the court ordered or the court allowed um, $750 or 750000 excuse me, in, um, dam in attorney's fees, which could possibly incentivize lawyers to bring these types of claims. So we'll see how that plays out. It may, it may or may not have any impact on the litigation that actually comes out of these things. Um, and I think the most important thing um, is that your policies are the right size for your organization. What, you know, a multinational organization writes and enforces is not going to be practical or feasible for a mom and pops type place. So anything that you do, you need to make sure that it's practical, it's feasible, and that it's something that you can maintain or that your organization can maintain. Um, you know, they're not, the small place is not going to have a specific PR person or a specific IT person. So these things are going to have to be sort of looked at whenever you're uh, drafting your policies and you're enforcing um, or, or following the notification provisions that we've talked about today. So I guess that's all I have. Um, I guess we can go to our Q&A if anyone has any questions. 